Intro. What are we doing here? Okay, I'm Eddie Burson. i am uh, been in the hobby for 40 years, and this is the World Diplomacy Championship 2007 uh, to determine the current champion. We have presently people from all over the world, including on the champion level. You have Rob Stevenson from Australia, who won the World Championship when it was down there. We have three Frenchmen who won the World Championships, respectively, in Berlin. Um, England and um, Denver. Oddly enough, I think a Frenchman has never won the World Championship in France. All right. Uh, you also have Chris Martin, the American, who won the World Championship in '97 or '98. I think '98. Uh, you have amongst here. You have. North American champions, there's at least six or eight of us, uh, including myself. There's also three European champions, including myself, and uh, two of the uh, Europeans. Uh, you have several Canadian champions. You have a champion from Italy, the champion from San Marino, the champion from uh, uh, De uh, not Denmark, uh, Netherlands. Uh, we have, uh, this is the collection of the best face-to-face -face tournament players in diplomacy in the world. So this is the 17th uh, World Championship. 17th World Championship and the 40th DIPCON, which is the North American Championship. And when, when did that start? 40 years ago? 40 years ago. Uh, it actually started in 67. Uh, and uh, has been continuous and it is the DIPCON as it's called moves around North America uh, and then as the uh, it was the original ch only championship diplomacy uh, tournament that ever mattered until the, the hobby became more international then 17 years ago we formed the international world diplomacy championship to move around the world so last year was in Berlin this year it's now in Canada and at uh, beautiful uh, Vancouver, uh, and next year we're going to be in Austria. Uh, we will decide at the end of this meeting, at the end of here, where it will be two years from now. Uh, in the past, it has been in Paris, in the Moor, in Gothenburg, uh, in uh, Birmingham, uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in Washington, D.C., in Denver, and uh, there's been multiple occasions in various of those cities. Okay. All right, anything else I can do for you? Yeah, it should be exciting, though. Yes, we're looking forward to it. <laughs> Most definitely. You know, this will be my... 12th time to the 13th of the 17 that I've been there, uh, and of the 40 Dipcons, I've been to 30 of them. And were you there from the beginning, from the I world? was in the second one. The second one. Right. Oddly Dipcon. enough, we didn't decide until the second one that the first one was the first one. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. And in the first Dipcon, there was just five people, and in the second one, we started with seven, and then it became ten. And uh, again, we started with diplomacy, but then when three other people came, we put the diplomacy board away and we played Youngstown, which is a 10-player variant. And it was actually held in Youngstown uh, in Ohio. Uh, and it wasn't until the third DIPCON that we actually played a game of diplomacy at a DIPCON. Uh, the DIPCONs were created as a social gathering of the postal hobby. People played diplomacy postally because they found it difficult to meet seven people for an, uh, an all-day game. So the DIPCONs were created as an excuse to go travel and meet the people that you were already corresponding with postally. So the very idea of a tournament at the DIPCON was alien to the initial purpose of the convention, which was a social gathering. Uh, and there was a, on the third DIPCON there was a tournament, and the first winner was John Smythe. Uh, on the fourth DIPCON, they went back to the social thing, and then on the fifth, from then on, there's always been a tournament of some sort of structure, and there has never been, in all the DIPCONs, there has never been the same scoring system used twice. Oh, okay. All right, and that sort of reflects the diplomacy hobby in that there, other than winning the game, there is no consensus of what achievement is if you don't win the game. Is it better to have 12 supply centers and be in a three-way drawer, or to have 
10 supply centers and have more supply centers than anyone else and have seven people alive? Is it better to have uh, uh, a four-way draw with six centers or a three-way draw with three centers? All right? No one can agree to those basic fundamental differences. Other than the ultimate win, which is? Which is to have 18 centers or have the players concede the game to you. And even in that, we are not, there's no consensus. There is no consensus as to how many non-win results equals a win result. There are, are two two ways as good as one, one win. Most people, some people will say yes, some will say no. Is In Europe they play with no concept of draws which can explain why Europe has been a hotbed of wars for so many years. Because they, they insist that somebody win, and therefore six people must lose. In America... And so 18, 18, 18 centers someone must get? Yes, yes, 18 centers, but with the Europeans, when they play in their tournaments, they play to a certain deadline, and then they say whoever has the most supply centers wins. Okay? Uh, and in North America, uh, the principal American concept of draws include all survivors and all are equal. Therefore, if we have a three-way draw and I have five centers and you have 14, well, we both are in a three-way draw. Uh, this is a fundamental difference in approach to gaming and approach to life, uh, as reflected in gaming between the Europeans and the North Americans. And this is reflected all around the world. Uh, doesn't matter whether you're, uh, where you go in South Africa, Brazil, the national bias in terms of relative position, it may be a class thing, it may be a, uh, uh, if you're Marxist, it's a class thing, if you're not a Marxist, then it, it's a cultural divide in terms of way you approach your self-evaluation as a country or as a group relative to the other groups, all right? If you come in a society where people say you have more, therefore you are better, uh, and more is being defined in a materialistic way, then you tend to see people playing on the basis of supply centers rule. Where you come into a society where there's less of a class difference or less of a fact that the divisions of the people uh, between the people, it doesn't matter that uh, you can go bowling ten times a week as long as I can go bowling twice a week. As far as I'm concerned, we're all equal. All right, then you'll find that those that society will have draw-based systems because they're less conscious of the inequalities on a materialistic thing. Anyway, that's my spiel as to where it goes. It's also added in that in Europe, there is no country in Europe where its neighbor in its history was not at one time its most mortal enemy and at another time its most its greatest savior whether it be Germany and France uh, fighting uh, together uh, or fighting against each other. England and France were mortal enemies for many years until they fought the Germans. All right? The Germans and the Russians all right, were mortal enemies in World War II and World War I, but prior to that, in the Napoleonic period, it was the Russians who saved the Germans against the aggression of the French. All right? In North America, we have none of that such experience because all we have is nice, good old Americans and nice, good old Canadians. All right? And Americans and Canadians, we get along great. There is no interplay of multitude of historic contacts. Okay, does that help give yeah, us that a That pretty background? much gives us a good intro. Thank you. Awesome.